I like the asking forgiveness as opposed to okay. Fair enough. So you're right. As opposed to Christian in the workspace, consent when it comes to bodily touch. Fair enough. Fair enough. I like the glass. Hello. My glass is like you. Hello. Ah. Hey, we're going to be talking in the same song. No, they're not. They're not. Uh, for $29.99, I'll tell you what. Gonna... <laughs> Back to school. Back to school, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming um, to this alumni association or the Lubar Alumni Association Business Success Series with our founders panel. Um, so, for those of you who don't know me, which I do see a lot of faces that I recognize, um, but my name is Paige Radke. I graduated from Lubar in 2015 with an MS in Finance and Certificate in Investment Management, and I just couldn't stay away. Um, so I am the current president of the Bar Alumni Association chapter, um, and we're just so excited to be here in the Entrepreneurship Center to welcome feather, fellow alumni, students, and of course, our amazing panel. <laughs> um, so to kick things off, could I just see a show of hands for who in the room is an alum of either UWM or the business school? Okay, and now keep, wait, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Um, put your hand down if you've been to an event before. So keep it up if this is your first time. Oh, well, okay, good. Yeah. So you have your <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Uh, I was expecting, expecting a few more, but, um, and now can I see a raise of hands if any of you are students today? Okay, good, good. So we got some students in the crowd. Thank you guys for coming. Um, so, given that we have some students who may not be familiar with the Alumni Association and some who this might be your first event in a while, um, I just want to take a minute to, you know, talk a little bit about the Lubar Alumni Association and how you can get involved. Um, so, when this was founded, we really had two main goals. Number one goal was to try to raise money to create a scholarship fund for a non-traditional student that we can give each year. And then the second goal was to connect, engage, and uplift our fellow alumni. Um, so since 2018, we've accomplished these goals by doing these business success series. And really, the, the reason that we like these is that we get to kind of wrap both of those initiatives into one. Traditionally, we're going to be raising money for our scholarship fund and then also creating this opportunity to connect alumni to opportunities, to other people in the network, and really try to strengthen those bonds. Um, in addition to that, we also will host some more casual socials, so just kind of happy hours or get together to just mingle and really learn more about the initiatives of both the association and the school. And we also do the UWM 414 Day of Giving Challenge to try to raise money, again, for the scholarship fund and just the school in general. Um, and I am pleased to announce that as of this summer, we actually officially endowed our scholarship fund. Uh, about the work of the alumni association, the board, and just all of the people involved in general. Um, and you know, the great thing about that is now it, it's in doubt, so we can give that scholarship in perpetuity. Um, but that doesn't mean we're done raising money. The hope is that we can either you know double the scholarship, make it two recipients, um, but continuing to have one of that—that that is our goals. 
but it also gives us that opportunity to really focus more on that second pillar, which is alumni engagement. Um, so how can you be more engaged, you know, whether this is your second event, <laughs> you your first, um, whether this is your second event, you're a student, you know, really how can you participate? Um, main thing, come to the events. Um, Jacqueline will talk a little bit more about those as well. Participate in that annual fundraiser and, you know, raise your hand to get on that leadership team and really help us drive that mission forward. We're really interested in having, you know, people from all spectrums. So whether you graduated when it was the UWM Business School or you graduated when it was the, the Lubar School of Business or now the Lubar College of Business, we really want to have that broad spectrum. Um, and then the other piece of that too is I am very happy to announce for those of you that don't know, um, we do have a new platform to help with alumni and student engagement. It is called Path Panther Connect. And the way I look at it, it's really like a more targeted version of LinkedIn, um, kind of specific to the university at large and really designed to connect alumni, students with engagement opportunities and whether that be jobs, mentorships, just more information about you know, how you can get involved. We really wanna connect to those people. We do have some more information for signups over here. So we would love for you guys all to get on that. Um, there is a specific group on there for the business school. So if you are a business alum, we'd love for you to join that. And, and like I said, you know, just making those connections and continue to strengthen those bonds with UWM students. Um, and so with that, I will pass it on to Jacqueline, who is our events chair, who did a phenomenal job getting this panel put together. Um, and she will give you a little bit more information on some of the upcoming events we have, as well as the background on this event in particular. So again, thank you all for coming. And you know, once you kind of conclude this part, feel free to come to me with questions. Um, I'm happy to, to answer any of those and connect you to some of the things we have going on. Thank you, Paige. Um, thank you all for being here. So like Paige mentioned, my name is Jacqueline. I'm the current events chair for the Lou Bar Alumni Association, and I, like her, could not stay away. I graduated in May of 2020, so, um, but I'm really happy to be here. Um, a couple of the other events, since we have you here at one, you can mark your calendars. Um, we have the homecoming match coming out next, next Friday, I believe, right? Um, uh, November 17th, so there is a nice little flyer there. Um, also, we have our Lubar Alumni Association mid-year meeting and holiday social, so that's open to everybody on Monday, December 4th, so if you're interested in getting more involved, um, please stop by and chat with us. Um, and then so next year, we have our two business success series, so similar to this panel here. Um, on Tuesday, March 5th, we have our Physicians Realty Trust, so um, that will be from 5.30 to 7.00. And Wednesday, April 23rd, we're scheduled for All Spring Global Investments. So um, just a quick plug too, we're um, always open to suggestions for topics like panels like this, or if you have a connection with a local business that you think would be a great host, uh, please talk to me or anybody um, on the alumni side. We're happy to um, take all ideas. So for the event, um, so, we, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Business Success Series, the Founders Panel. This is a spin on our traditional event. So um, we have panelists from all different industries, all different kind of stages of entrepreneurship. And so um, we're really excited to come together and hear all of their um, insight and expertise. Um, so I'm just gonna jump in so we can get started. Um, but joining us, we have Britt from Gino.me. Gino me. Gino me, okay, sorry. Uh, we have Natin from Folgix. Politics. Okay. <laughs> um, Ruben uh, from My Way Out and The Way Out, and I'll let him tell his story on that. Um, Bahula with um, Cross Cutty, and then Kathy uh, with the Panera Group. And then, last but not least, we have our moderator for this evening, Dr. Nathaniel Stern. He is the prof a professor of art and design and mechanical engineering. He is the director of the UWM Startup Challenge. Executive Director of the Autism Brilliance Lab for Entrepreneurship, Affiliated Faculty uh, for the Northwestern Mutual Data, Data Science Institute, and Associate Researcher for the University of Johannesburg. So, Dr. Stern, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks. You got my. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Good answer that. It's a rhetorical question. Um, I hope you're in for an exciting ride today. We have uh, a really eclectic and electric group of founders here today that I'm very excited to hear from. Um, 
again, I'm Nathaniel Stern. I like to, uh, and between art, engineering, and entrepreneurship. So I like to say I teach artists how to engineer, engineers how to art, and everyone to sustain their passion, which is how I define wow. entrepreneurship. Um, and I'm really pleased that for the ongoing collaborations between the Entrepreneurship Center and, and the Libar College, I'm really excited to introduce foundational representation, meaning founders, um, from starting over here on our left, the Panera Group, which is recruiting for tech talent, Proskudi, which is uh, free and easy international money transfers using the blockchain, is that right? Um, and then we've got uh, employment opportunities for formerly incarcerated individuals, uh, free and easy, oh no, I said that one already, digital twinning and manufacturing AI for a reduction of downtime, super hot. Um, and then uh, searchable ecosystem of linked genetic and medical data. So when we say we got a really mixed group here, it's, it's pretty incredible across science, finance, recruitment, social innovation, and more. It's very exciting. I would love it if each of our founders in any order, so you like whoever wants to start can start, but we're gonna to get to everybody, uh, could just first take a couple of minutes uh, to introduce yourselves and, and briefly, because there's a lot to discuss and so many exciting things happening, share a bit about your background and your journey to your current business. Should you be voluntold? <laughs> okay, I started over here, so we're going to start over there. Right. Yeah, I knew I was going to have to go first. Anyway. Yeah, you're what? I'm Bert Gottschalk. I'm the founder and CEO at Genome. Um, I'm originally from Milwaukee, born and raised. Uh, and Genome uh, is a health data exchange platform. Uh, we're headquartered here in Milwaukee. What we do is we empower people to control their data, their health data at scale, because we believe they own it. Uh, it's a novel idea, right? But um, we link electronic medical records, so think your epic my chart, Cerner clinical summary, et cetera, with uh, genetic and genomic reports. Uh, so 23 me Ancestry.com, our whole sequence genome report, you might give them a specialist. Uh, we de-identify that information, and we make that available for purchase for researchers um, in the pharmaceutical, clinical trial, clinical research spaces, so Stanford Medical, Mayo Clinic, et cetera. Um, and we actually compensate people for access to their data. So um, each time their data set is purchased, uh, they get a payout for it, which seems fair. So um, fair and yet rare. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we can go into that a little bit later. But um, I, I had I have a background uh, in psychology, so I went to UW Milwaukee College of Letters and Science um, and got a, my bachelor's in general psych, and then I ended up going to grad school, getting a dual masters in business administration and industrial organizational psychology. So I'm interested in marrying people and process and making that more efficient. And I wouldn't have figured that out if I didn't go to UWM first and figure out that um, the only way that we're going to make strides in this world uh, and doing them effectively is if we can get people to work together and do it in a way that is fair and equitable for all. I think we need to hear that in like every platform everywhere right now and look at the world we're living in. So thank you for that. Do you want all right, hey, um, I'm Nitin Ranjan, uh, founder and CEO of Goldings. Uh, we are a manufacturing AI company. Uh, what we do is we uh, empower manufacturers to uh, predict and prevent their un, uh, per, uh, interruptions, failures, quality losses. And we do that through our turnkey AI software. Basically, it works only with the existing data. So no more hardware, sensors, meters are needed. For that reason, we are able to like, it's a very lightweight application mm -hmm. that gets deployed in four weeks so they can get to value faster. And a um, little bit of background about me. Uh, I did graduate in 2010 uh, with a master's in electrical engineering from UW. Um, and um, back then, I used to uh, teach senior design. Uh, I was a teacher, a teaching assistant for that course. And at that time, it gave me the impetus to like really try out different ideas. And uh, for the last 15 years, I worked with many manufacturers, industrial clients, dealing with their data, and trying to really see what would really empower them rather than just, you know, Traditionally, they're not software savvy. They, they need something which helps them with the outcomes, not just more data. So that is the reason why we started the company. And uh, we are helping them basically if, see if they continue to operate the way they're operating, will they have a downtime or not? And so that's, that's kind of helped them to uh, plan their day better, get, get ahead of things, and uh, really uh, make their uh, production targets. Well, the, the art nerd in me, uh, is this on? The art nerd in me is like super intrigued by the idea of being able to use any kind of data and find the way towards downtime discovery, which is like blows my mind a little bit. It's kind of amazing how far we've come. 
Yeah, and the funny part is that data set that I'm talking about has been generated since eighties. Like the machines have been generated, but it's just dirty and, and right. messy. Incredible, incredible. All right, please. Oh wow. <clears throat> well, Ruben Gavota, uh, Ruben Gavota, I get to say in Spanish. I'm the co-founder for the way out. I'm also the executive director for the nonprofit, which is my way out. But I'll stick to the for profit uh, along with my partner Eddie Rivera. So we're breaking the cycle of incarceration through technology and making rich jobs. So we created a Bear Shack employment platform. What it does is it allows anybody who's being just impacted on um, coming to create a profile. Anything that could be biased against them is eliminated, it's kind of closed. So we allow the employer to just see a contextual profile of that individual based on qualifications, certifications, employment history, and a professional summary that the person writes. And at the same time, yeah, the, the employer to create a profile and look for people, but the employer itself is also closed. Mm -hmm. So the just involved individual does not know what company he's applying for. He allows the employer to be full transparent as well and say what criminal history backgrounds they're willing to hire. So on the back end, you know, the algorithm is kind of like a dating app, kind of like Tinder. Mm -hmm. If all that matches, it's introducing one to another. And then it's when the employer says, you know what? I like what I'm reading. I want to meet this person and move to the next level. And they did interview, then the off token comes off. And both of them are able to see who one and the other is. I uh, lived up on my, myself. I'm originally from El Paso, Texas. Yeah. Moved to Milwaukee in 2015. Left to the military for six and a half years, did three deployments for all those uh, happy early veterans day. We got any veterans in here. Uh, and then eventually, in 2007, when I was getting ready to re enlist, they told me to do my five back surgeries. I couldn't re enlist no more. And I went in a down spiral, started becoming a big drug dealer. Mm. Unfortunately, hit the wrong, hang around with the wrong friends, ran a million dollar drug or, uh, organization until I got cut up. And in the blink of an eye, my whole life changed. So I went from being a veteran, uh, an employer for the Department of Defense, a supervisor, into being labeled a felon. So upon coming home in 2017, I was told that my life and career were over to go settle for a very minimum paying job. So I laughed at that and said, I'm not even getting down to five. No, my mistake was not to find four ahead. So <clears throat> I got a job as a case manager, did that for about a year, got a job with the state of Wisconsin uh, the next following year, did that for about a year, and quickly realized that you know black and brown people were the, were the most affected by the criminal system. And we needed to do a better job to provide opportunities and also provide those services so they could be successful. And in 2019, I said, you know what? My, my employer told me that I couldn't sit on a panel discussion like this. And I said, well, here's my 45 day notice. Mm -hmm. And then he said, what are you gonna do next? I said, I wanna become an entrepreneur. Got enrolled in one of the classes right here in UW Milwaukee, started learning more about entrepreneurial. And I said, okay, I uh, like this is what we're doing. And that's when uh, the way I was born. Wow. Congratulations on what an incredible journey. And thank you for the work that you're doing to help others that have found themselves in a similar situation because of the life they've been dealt. Um, I also have to say, I love that you kind of work the system in a way to do for-profit and non-profit where it's necessary in order to get the job done. Because sometimes there's a question of, you know, a, a not-for-profit is just a government label that says you can take your money from somewhere and not from somewhere else. And sometimes for-profit can actually do more for social innovation. I think it's incredible. Yeah, most definitely, you know, especially if you're only good as an employee, as your life needs and circumstances. Mm -hmm. So if we address all those issues, you know, especially with the population that we're working with, mm -hmm. and then we send them back to the workforce, having the support that they need, and the turnaround, of, the turnover rate for the employer is a lot more higher and more successful. Amazing. Thank you. You wouldn't believe that I am a blockchain nerd, so I'm excited to get them across <laughs> food, but I am teaching myself Solidity today, actually. I started learning Solidity, so please. Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm Robert Devi. I'm the founder and CEO of Crosscody. Uh, Crosscody is a global uh, payment platform uh, where uh, we're building a platform where people can send money uh, abroad uh, to their families and also pay businesses directly. Um, so when we actually started, um, you know, I was, you know, being an immigrant myself uh, from Nigeria, um, I realized that you know, sending money uh, abroad is still quite expensive uh, on these on different uh, P2P platforms out there. You know, when I say P2P platform, I mean platforms like Western Union and, and, and the rest. 
Uh, so uh, we, you know, we wanted to initially like focus on reducing the fees and making it, you know, affordable, you know, faster uh, payments. Uh, but we soon realized that apart from you know people sending, you know, the more more like when people are sending money abroad, they are not just sending money to them, you know, to support families. In addition to that. They invest heavily in um, real estate uh, opportunities mm -hmm. in their home countries. I mean, according to um, uh, a New York City Department of Consumer Affairs uh, study on, on immigrant finance, uh, the primary uh, long term investment savings for immigrants is uh, through home ownership in their home countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but there's a lot of laws to fraud uh, in, in that process uh, because. When people send money, they send money through uh, a P two A platform, uh, you know, you know, and send it to a family member, uh, so the family member can help them to pay contractors or pay, you know, business, you know, or building material sellers, uh, and you know, that, that's how you know, they and they experience uh, loss to fraud. So what we are building is a platform that will make it uh, easy uh, for people to make the payments directly uh, to businesses, and most especially. Uh, contractors and uh, sellers of uh, building materials. Uh, my background uh, from Nigeria, I uh, lived in Chicago for a little bit. While I was there, I drove taxi uh, to survive before going back to school. I uh, did my undergrad here at UWM and my master's as well because I did the uh, CPA route and uh, eventually joined PWC as a tax consultant, and I worked on our uh, edge fund and private equity clients. Mm -hmm. And while I was at the firm, I uh, co led a uh, blockchain community of interest. So that's uh, a global call uh, for our PWC stars uh, that are interested in learning more about blockchain and cryptocurrencies and how we can utilize it to serve our clients. But then uh, the firm was not really ready to like get more into it. Mm -hmm. So I kept looking, you know, dig into in, into the technology, and that's how I uh, came up with the solution to use it uh, to solve uh, cross border payments uh, uh, issues, uh, which I tested uh, for myself and shared with friends and family, and then they started sharing with people within their network. So that's what made me to like then the PwC uh, to uh, commercialize the solution for cross border. Yeah, wonderful. I love hearing that. You know, I think with FTX and lots of other things like blockchain, rightfully, there are some bad actors. But to me, the, the kind of future where understanding that a trans dash action is not necessarily only monetary, that you can start on the space of trying to help your family and then move to a space of making money. I think it's a beautiful story. It's great to hear. Last and certainly not least, well, I get to keep my own microphone? Mm -hmm. This is dangerous. I don't know. All right. <laughs> Let's hear about your journey to tech recruitment. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Kathy Panaro. Nice to meet all of you. Glad to be here. Um, back at um, I'm a graduate of UWM uh, long ago. I won't say when, <laughs> um, but I have a psych degree. Um, I was always very much a nerd and interested in people. Um, you know, I read Psych Psychology Today magazine. Um, Fast Company was a new magazine back in the day when I was in college. Um, and then I went into grad school and I started grad school later after I started my business and it really gave me some legs in terms of, you know, the financial, the accounting and so forth. Um, my story isn't as riveting as Ruben's. Um, I, uh, mine is more about, um, you know, if you were talking about a founder and what drives you to go into business, mine was motherhood, um, which is the most important job in the world, I'd say. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, you love your mom? Okay, good. I love your mom. Okay, that's exactly. We can all relate, right, in some way. So, um, but I um, started my company because I had worked in corporate America and I had done, I was running a larger corporation, um, which I cut my teeth and I got a lot of training there um, in business and how to operate the business, hiring, training, sales, etc. Um, but then I had a child and I was working seven to seven, as most people do when they're younger. And I just had to have more flexibility. So um, that's something that I really carry with me in my company now is having that flexibility for our team. Um, we specialize in, as far as our business, um, we are an RPO firm, which is recruitment process outsourcing. And it's a very unique model where, uh, and our, our company's 
a little bit more unique because we serve smaller to medium sized businesses. Um, we take over their recruiting function and uh, we're specializing in IT, engineering, manufacturing, um, and construction. I cut my teeth in IT. Um, when I first started, I would take network engineers out to lunch in exchange for them telling me what they do. And that's how I learned. <laughs> Um, but you know, the, 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 you know, the, the world that I, uh, work in allows flexibility. Um, but we're very serious about our services. Um, we do, we're really experts in technology. Um, we are not going to go total AI, no offense, but, um, we're going to stay very human centric and our model, um, you know, is that human contact and having a conversation, a real interview with someone, learning about somebody so that we can make that authentic match um, culturally and technically with the client. So that's kind of a long story, but- no, it was great, it was you know, perfect. So yeah, how we got in. It sounds like all of you um, read the fine print that you were all contractually obligated to talk about your awesome experiences at UWM. So I appreciate that. Um, but I'm curious now, like to further deepen that point, even if they were years apart, was there, and as a professor, I especially want to hear this, uh, a moment, a person, a class, a program, a student group that you can recall that was something really transformational for you here? And can you tell us about it? I can, I'll go first again. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I remember being in my psych, uh, it was a psych a stats class. And um, I remember my professor at the time, I don't remember her name. She put up a graphic as a pie chart and it was talking about the different careers in psychology. And half of half the pie chart was colored with um, people that go into counseling. And I was like, well, I got enough problems, man, I don't want to do that. Uh, and then I got, there was another slice and it was maybe about like 20 to 30%. And they would go into clinical, right? And then so you had like all these other ones that were like little fractions of percentages after that, like abnormal psychs, another academic track, very hard to, uh, a lot of competition, very hard to get into, but that would have been my uh, my uh, track of choice um, if I was- I hear more sister, academic. I hear you. Yeah, so I mean, I was like, oh, maybe I should do something more practical. And then I saw this little sliver, it was like 0.5% of people become, uh, or psych majors become um, industrial organizational psychologists. And that's the study of group behaviors and working with settings. And I was like, oh, what's that? So I did some more research, um, figured out that there was a huge business tie into that. And I was like, oh, that's great. You know, that people can get the way for me to become like a process improvement consultant, a management consultant, et cetera, which it, I was what I ended up doing in my the first part of my career. But that was, transformative for me because that made me want to pursue a graduate degree in IO Psych and uh, that led me to where I'm at today. Amazing. Uh, me, when I did, uh, I enrolled into introduction to uh, business because I wanted to learn the lingo. You know, uh, like I said, I come from a unique background. They didn't really know nothing about business the right way. So I like, I need to know the lingo. So how, how do I learn that? So I took a class into introduction into business. And I remember my professor telling us about a pitch competition. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was like, okay, this is where I get out of my comfort zone because I'm such an introvert. I'd rather be at home watching Netflix, glass of wine, crying, <laughs> this long. I feel like we're the same person. I'm telling you. So, but it was a challenge. You know, I think, you know what, let me, let me try to do this. Let me enroll and see if we got what it takes, you know, and then started learning that. You know, less than two percent or about two percent get VC funding, mm -hmm. and I always like that challenge. So I was like, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna get VC funding. <laughs> we're gonna be part of that two percent. How would it feel to say I'm part of that two percent who got VC funding, pre-seed, and all this? And I did the pitch, and we ended up finishing the second. I ended up finishing the second base, but that right there in itself was like, I think if my professor, I would come back and tell him like. Look, this is what we're doing with the way out. Like, damn, Ruben, that's 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 cool. Like, <laughs> I want to hear more about this. So, you know, I think my professor at that early stage played a big role in boosting my confidence, knowing that I could transfer the skills that I had illegally into a ton of legal and make an impact and continue to help people. So absolutely. It's one of those things that you know we often talk about our majors and like the depth of study we do, but I think just like learning to navigate the bureaucracy that is the world and being encouraged to find our way is a huge part of the college experience. I'll go next. Um, I think I shared a little bit about the senior design course. Um, I'll go a little bit more detail about it. Uh, so 
this is 13 years ago. Um, I was about 50 now. Um, I was a uh, teaching assistant for a senior design course for EE uh, in EMS building. And uh, my professor was Jeffrey Kauser at that time. And he was a GE associate professor. So he used to work with GE and used to come here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was an immigrant. I came in as an exchange student and uh, uh, he kind of like took me under his wing. Uh, took me some baseball games as well, front seats. So it was great. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, um, so, you know, senior design course, like any other capstone design projects, you have a group of people who will come in with their ideas and start to make a prototype in literally three months. And um, I taught that for post semester. And it was a great experience for me because, you know, coming coming from India, like there was a lot of fear as to like, you know, what's what's going to be out there when I get out of the job market and stuff. But, you know, just just observing and teaching that course was like a team of four people. And they had a design, they had to execute it. You get you get mentorship from IEEE labs and you know, you have all these people surrounding you. You can actually ask for help or anything. But the fact that if you put a good idea and a good team together, anything is possible. And they were able to prototype like yeah, guns and controls, like battery packs, rock a lot of mission. They they made a guitar tuner in less than six weeks, I remember. And there were some long nights, not gonna lie. Like, you know, I was in, <laughs> I was in the lamp with them trying to um, troubleshoot some things. But just the fact that, you know, you have an idea and you put the right team behind it and you have great mentors around you, you can you can accomplish anything. Yeah. That was worth it. Love to hear. I think I'm going ahead. Um, so my mind is, um, so when I joined UWM and I got to know about uh, uh, Delta and Sigma Pi, uh, business personality, mm -hmm. um, you know, Joining that organization really gave me and like helped me to set a minimum standard mm -hmm. for myself, you know, like because like we went through a lot, like you know, understanding, you know, uh, the uh, the organization, you know, like doing quizzes every week, and you can did interview uh, to before getting into it. And I remember one of the questions uh was like you know was um who who like what like who like what motivates you or something like that, you know. Um and that back then it was uh, uh, a bank founder in Nigeria, you know, something like you know, someone that I was like kind of like looking up to. Uh, so in that I kept remembering that. And you know, when I got into the uh uh, uh fraternity, he helped me to like you know set a minimum standard for myself in the business world and I kind of just carried on on that and then I'm just kind of just so like you know sometimes I just like look back and like I'm glad I went through you know join them because that helped me to make it you know it set it set the standard for me yeah uh, in the business world and it's so important to maintain that even in our daily lives like yeah. I try not to even phone in breakfast to my kids you know? <laughs> like, my guess is minimum standard like there needs to be milk in the Julius <laughs> <laughs> I have um, a memory. So when I went through high school, I was very agitated about being sitting in a desk. <laughs> and I think most entrepreneurs are like that. Um, and I also, I didn't think I was that smart. I just kind of, you know, I was bored with things. I didn't pick things up. Um, I picked things up fast, but I didn't really, I wasn't really interested. And so I just remember um, some, you know, poignant moments for me where one was when I was in a psych class in Bolton in the large lecture hall and uh, I studied really hard and they put my the grades up for the exam and the top number was my number on my exam <laughs> and I it was just a fun moment for me because it validated that you know I'm in the right place mm -hmm. I guess you know and and then um, I think the other thing was then I started business school and um, in business school we had classes like, I just remember the art of negotiating and we had a professor that made it very fun. I don't remember the professor's name, but it really, um, it taught me a lot about business um, because, and it opened my eyes to that business is not just a transaction. It's really about relationships and communicating. And that was just something that really impacted me, so. So cool, I appreciate it. So on the one hand, all of your stories are so different, all the things that inspired you. So on the other hand, it's at the core, it's just like, I got validation, I got a path to celebrate. 
This is this is where UWM pointed me. All right, I know that we probably have a few students and a, and a few alum in here who are thinking about going off on their own, who are thinking about starting their own venture, whether in the public interest, private interest. They have an idea. They don't. They just want to work for themselves. Have you know, small business versus startup versus venture cap. What key advice would each of you give? And, and we're gonna we're gonna flip it over and we're gonna start over here this time. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> what key advice would you give? Gosh, it's so much. Yeah. Um, I've been in business a long time and I've seen a lot. Um, I would say get over the fear, mm -hmm. write a business plan. <laughs> if you can't write the plan, you probably aren't going to be able to hold yourself accountable to all the work that needs to be done day in and day out um, because it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, and, you know, the plan doesn't have to be perfect. I don't know. I have a lot of advice, but um, but don't you know, use ChatGPT for your plan. Right? <laughs> no, no. Um, and I'm trying to put myself back into those days of um, and then money. I personally self-funded my company my the whole way through. Wow. And had never had an investor. Um, but that was you know that was scary yep. at times. So I had a credit card. I think I bought my office furniture with a credit card, and I you know got up some phone lines, and I was in business. You know. I think that's um, an important point to bring up too, because I you know, mentioned you know oh only two percent get venture capital, but a much yeah. larger percentage of that still yeah. make a sustainable business. You don't be necessarily scrappy. yeah yeah be scrappy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, be scrappy is really I mean really you know yeah, undiluted scrappy. investment yeah. is your friend or you know uh, you small business. Most of the most of the startups that come out of the center are like yoga studios, food trucks, just yeah. people who want to work for themselves and be able to live their values. And I, I personally didn't look for financing. I was trying to avoid that. And so that may be scrappy. So you can you can accomplish a lot with a little. And then don't, I think my last thing, I don't want to, but is You're to awesome. look to others for as, as experts mm -hmm. and don't do everything yourself. <laughs> now you've got to just get it. Yeah. So. yeah um, you know, going off of you know, what you say, like uh, it's very important like, you know, to surround yourself with people uh, that, can, that can help you. Because it's uh it's a uh, it's very hard uh you know building a company from you know from, from ground up. Uh, so you constantly need help. Um and that's why you know, there's you know, so many uh startup programs, uh incubators, accelerator programs out there. Uh some provide grants, some provide you know investment, some provide you know just you know, other resources, uh you know, training. Uh, you know, to help. So it's very important to, you know, tap into those resources, you know, constantly looking at different avenues uh, to get help because like, it's just, you know, like how they say it takes a, a village to raise a child, it takes a village to build a company as well. Uh, so, and, um, and just, you know, keep grinding. And another thing is, um, Sometimes, like you know, what you start out to build may not be necessarily be what you end up building. So, which means don't get too stuck on your initial idea, uh, because the goal is as you in working on it, you discover new things, you realizing oh this you know what I thought would, this would be without even this would be the case. So it's good to quickly like you know sometimes take some te steps back and. You know, take a holistic look at you know uh, your business strategy and how things are going, and quickly uh make changes or you know uh you know diverts whenever you, you need to. Yeah, fail quickly, fail often, and pivot. Yeah, pivot. <laughs> we don't fail. We do not be afraid of pivot. <laughs> I'll tell you, the pandemic taught us all that. Okay? Oh man, you know, um, I think I would talk start off with like dream. Plan and execute, mm -hmm. you know, and then the next thing would be always bet on yourself because mm -hmm. I guarantee you we're always going to hear a lot more no's than a yes, but you only need that one yes, mm -hmm. you know, to continue to keep going and and be mindful to take time to acknowledge no matter how big the win is or how small, a win is a win. Mm -hmm. I think often as entrepreneurs, we close a deal, we do something, and we don't take the time to say, wow. You know, and be mindful of the meetings that you're setting yourselves up. One of the biggest opportunities we almost passed on was with Google. 
-hmm. So Google started it uh, their first ever uh, in 2022, Google Latinos uh, Bonder Fest. So we had applied, we had interviewed, and then we had a second interview that we were not even gonna show up. Like we were so worn out, we were tired. We had just left the meeting with DLC and both me and my partner were like, you know what, we're drained. And I was like, you got this. And he was like, Ruben, you got this. And, <laughs> and we both ended up logging into the meeting regardless, you know, never miss a meeting. And at the end of the meeting, here we thought we're pitching again. And it was only to for them to not, notify us that we were one of the first ever 50 companies that got profit by Google. You know, so well that right there, that validation was like, holy shit, like Google <laughs> even us, like, and then we're one of the 50, and it was not the good fun, right? <laughs> so that's always right. Uh we bootstrapped our company as well. Like I said, I mean, we started with five dollars. Uh, we made that toast. If you guys are familiar. My co-founder had an idea, and I had an idea, and I said, I bring the the uh, social worker background, he brings the uh, business background, and I said, well, how do we date both of them and make it a beautiful marriage? And we're like, here's my five dollars, here's our five dollars, and we had a lot of pitch competitions, winning, stay focused, stay grinding, and network, network, and like I said, continue better. Mm -hmm. So much. I think they're taking all of the uh, all of the recommendations. Like but... the patent office, there's no idea. Like... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, like I would say, I'll just you know, I'm a tech uh, founder uh, startup. So I'm and I'm only in for three years so far. So I'm not gonna tell you the advice which everybody else has been. But for me, for my personal experience, the biggest challenge I personally faced was the fear. Right, like so, I graduated in 2010. Uh, remember the economy at that time, got a job after master's, which was not that pain, but it was good, um, grow to the rank, and I was a chief technology officer. Yeah. It literally took a pandemic to make me reflect and understand that what I'm doing is not achieving, like it's not challenging enough, and it's not letting me achieve my potential. So at that stage, I, I remember this mentor I met, and uh, he said, you want to start your own business? I'm like, yep. He's like, do you have the four Ds? And I was like, what, what do you mean by 40s? So being a tech founder, 40s meant technology, team, traction, and the terms. So a technology is a great idea of tech, right? A team is the people you want to work with who can take that to market. Uh, term is, say, a business strategy, a business model, which you want to uh, service that. And the fourth one, the traction is, is there is a product market fit. Like, is somebody going to buy your product? Trust me, you're not going to have the four things in place when you start your company. <laughs> Never going to happen. But you need to have the one which will help you build the other three. It could be anything. It could be an idea, so you have a tech. It could be a great team, which you have worked with in your network for a long time. They can help you bring anything to market. You might have a great business plan, and that can be commercialized. So find that one thing which is working for you, and then the other three T's will come along if you want to be a tech bar. But um, so that's that's on the pragmatic and you know kind of a structure way of me going over my fear. But at the end of the day, I would say, you know, grind, uh, you know, being um, you know persistent about certain things, getting all the no's you can. One thing will will which you will need is passion to do anything. You have to get out of the bed at odd hours, being trained as Ruben said in any meeting. And the passion is not something anybody can give, give you or you can teach you. Passion is something which you really care about. For me, it was seeing my, you know, my father uh, used for uh, worked for a manufacturing uh, plant for 38 years back in India, and he grew to the ranks and he became an executive. But I always saw him leaving in the middle of the night for fixing the machine because they can't meet the targets. I didn't correlate me starting my business was that was a reason why I did it. But today, when I reflected, and it was two years ago when I when somebody asked me this question, like, why this? What makes you get out of the bed at three in the morning and go to your laptop and do all these things? Like, what is it? And that's when I realized that I never felt like work to me. It always felt like natural because in my head, I was helping my dad try not to go to the office to fix the machine because if he would have known that's going to break, he would have fixed it before he left the office. So that's the reason why I did my, that's the, that's the passion which drove me to do this. So you got to find your own passion.
If that's you after every story has been told, I want to see you have your first cup of coffee. <laughs> Uh, I guess on my end, uh, I, I think a lot of people think that uh, becoming an entrepreneur starts with an idea and it doesn't start with self-awareness because you need to understand, first of all, like, are you going to be honest enough with yourself to say, you know what, I think I can do it. I think I can go three years without making a profit and keeping it in my bank account to go ahead and believe in an idea that nobody else is going to support and haven't supported, at least for that period of time, because you might get to a point where that does happen. It's very real. If you're not intrinsically motivated, if you don't know why you're doing something, why you're getting up, why you're making it happen, and how that equates to your purpose as an individual, don't just buy into an idea. Don't start a company. It's not for everybody. And I think that's something that you know is important to know because if you aren't somebody who can say, I would put my reputation, I would put my finances, I would put my relationships on the line for this idea because I believe in it that much, then it's not worth pursuing because that's what it's going to take. Um, I would also say, <laughs> I would also say, uh, yeah, and I would also say, um, you know, be afraid, but do it anyway, because you're going to be afraid of doing anything uh, that's, that's new or foreign or different, even if you've done it a million times. Like with my company, like, We've raised almost 3.25 million in capital. I had to get in front of investors and pitch to get, you know, 2.6 million of that. And I was afraid and I did it anyway, every single pitch, right? You know, we've secured clients um, that we didn't know that we were going to have, uh, you know, at the start of the year without any, and now we're ending the year with, um, you know, revenue stream and a few, and each and every onboarding meeting, each and every um, pitch that I gave about the product, the value prop, why they should care about it, was afraid of it and did it anyway. Like, it's okay to be afraid. That fear should motivate you to do well. And so I, I think that that's something that is also, you know, something that people don't really talk about, but fear can be powerful. Um, and then the other thing I will say is like, make sure you have a way to stay mentally tough and emotionally tough because you gotta find what that thing is for you. Because for me, it's, um, it's physical activity, it's exercise, it's running. Um, I got really into it uh, back in college, and it was one of those things that, you know, empowered me to feel like, okay, if I can run this mile, if I can just get over that hill, if I could just, you know, get through that stretch that I just don't think I can make, then, you know, I can really do anything. So you got to figure out something that's going to keep you tough, and you got to stay dedicated to it. I mean, if it was easy, everybody would do it. If being great was easy, everybody would be great, and that's just not realistic. So you got to be realistic, but if you can do all that, oh my God. The payout is totally worth it. Every day when I wake up and I, you know, have this amazing group of people surrounding me because I believed in myself, to me, it was worth it to, to put everything on the line to go ahead and start my, my company. Thank you so much. This crew, you, I got to say, you guys made my job really, really easy. I, I just let you run with whatever. Uh, we've got a little bit of time left for the rest of our program. I'm curious if there are any questions from the audience that we have for any individual founder or all of them. I guess, I guess I didn't quite understand. You take like genetic testing? Yeah, so, oh yeah, the business model, yeah. Okay, so what we do is we don't create any new information. We, we just uh, take information that's already populated in electronic medical record or a genetic report um, and we package it. So we make it easy to transfer that data to an institution that purchases it. Yeah, because I... I'm from a medical background, I would think if somebody say is like at risk for a certain disease, insurance companies will surely know that. Oh yeah, they would. They're, they're <laughs> yeah. And also, yeah. uh, pharmaceutical companies would really like to know that because they want to market to that person. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then clinical trial companies because they want the biomarkers. So there's a lot of value in that data. Yeah. yeah. But it's a matter of keeping it private. Unless there's the case, okay. And so unless there's a case where we also have the opportunity for people that become contributors, it's what we call people that share data on our platform, to opt in to being contacted for clinical trials. Now, if you opt into that, you're agreeing to share uh, certain pieces of your data so that a research institution can get in contact with you. So it'd be like your name, email address, right? Um, but if you don't opt into that, then yes, your data would remain completely de-identified. Okay. 
I, I, mean, I would just think there's enough medical records in the state of Wisconsin belong to the individual, not to the doctor. They belong to the individual person. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, that's the thing. Well, here's the thing. The, a, lot, a lot of people don't know their rights around data sharing. A lot of people don't know that they have different types of access to their medical information and that it's illegal for medical institutions or health systems I, to I, charge. I just think that you need, need to hear it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, if I could show, if I was, I was if, I could, if I could show you all of the, I was going to say, if I could show you all of the um, security and compliances that we've had to go through and the documentation we've had to provide, like, we're HIPAA compliant SOC 1, SOC 2. Um, we're going to have to get our high trust in, in a couple of years. Um, and we also, um, we also are, uh, you know, we comply with any kind of HIPAA standards, you know, anything else that is related to medical data sharing. So most of our infrastructure is, yeah, yeah, it's not cheap. <laughs> in the weeds, I'm wondering if you could, he identified that and gave it to him, and then he'll just tell us when we're going to get sick <laughs> and, and when we're going to, you know, how long we're going to be healthy, and we'll figure it all out. <laughs> I, bet you, I bet you did. I bet you did. Any questions from the audience? I thought I saw it. Okay. So, this is a question for you, Nis. Did I find myself right? Yeah. Okay. So, you were talking about from the 80s, we're having a lot of information from the companies that they were generating. So, what kind of steps would you take for the AI modeling for transforming information and making it usable and readable? It's so like basically understanding and make the qualtrics and recommendations off it. Yeah. So, when I said that data has been there since the 80s, what I meant was like, you know, most of the machines are run by a controller, right? It's not really a switch anymore. It's like a programmable PLC or, or some kind of controller. Those controllers are actively making decisions on some data, right? That data is machine generated, is not a human readable. So but the syntax is encrypted. You can actually, if you can decipher it and put it into a synthetic generated model, you can actually translate that data into human readable form. But that is still pending. Every time a sub failure is gonna happen, there's 10,000 records which comes out of the controller. So you can't really human even identify the root cause of the problem. So taking that data, transforming it into a human readable form, and then feeding into a signal processing to so that the pattern recognition AI can actually understand the patterns in the data in order to predict the failures. So that's the data we, we take. We reduce the noise to signal ratio. We, we apply the pattern recognition. Now the pattern is learned. So the user or the human doesn't need to understand the pattern, the signal, the data, and everything. What they need to know is my machine going to fail or not? So that's the information we give to the consumer so that so they can consume it that way and they don't have to worry about all the gibberish coming out of the machine. Thank you very much. Okay, that's the question. Um, so this question is for Kathy um, specifically. So, you know, your business is a little bit more established. You know, we have everything from startup to kind of in that mid phase to, you know, the more established business. Um, could you just talk a little bit about, you know, at what point in time did you start to feel like, okay, I'm established, you know, what, what were those signals from that transition from startup to, okay, this is a, a well-run operated business? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it was obviously when you build your teams, you have people and they start, you were able to start delegating. Um, but then when it was really that we had a process that we could repeat over and over and we started documenting it. Um, and that's the secret sauce, you know, is really the, what we do uh, is very efficient. Um, and that translated translates into obviously revenue, but also it's at a lower cost for the, the client. Um, so anytime you can do that, right? Um, it's a value add. Um, and, and also I think uh, our culture, being again a mom, I wanted to have a culture that I'm very proud of our company culture. We're very um, work hard, play hard, but there's no walk of shame if somebody has to go to a baseball game for their kid or take care of an elderly parent. Um, so I think for me too is knowing, seeing that I created the culture that I wanted for the company and it's alive um, and it continu it continues now and it keeps getting better and better. So I'd say those two things, so, you know, it's the business process and then the culture. Thank you. I'll open this up to anybody. Um, 
imposter syndrome. <laughs> Big. So <laughs> it, it, is it something that you manage and you live with and it's something that you're still challenged by or you hit an inflection point? All of a sudden, I have the confidence. I can do this. I am who I say I am. And it's something that you leave behind. Well, I'm real big in the positive syndrome. Like, I think it's a daily battle for me, especially because the stigma that's already said in front of me, generation through generation, so being labeled as bad and MRI, or just be back in person, that is always something when you go in front of a, like, we're pitching. You know, as a brown person, we know we don't get a lot of things defunded. So how does it look like as a brown person with a criminal record to get being defunded? But um, I think Frank from Beta uh, Philanthropy, you know, I love the guy. Uh, Frank is my man. I asked him one time, uh, about a year ago, I said, Frank, how is it that you have such a swag, brother? Like, man, you know, like, I want to have that swag. And he said, Ruben, let me tell you this right now. Don't forget your value. Don't ever undersell your value. Remember, those people that are pitching, you don't need them. They need you to make more money. They want to buy your idea. Without your idea, they don't make no more money. Uh, like So they need you. You don't need them. And I think at that moment, like if I wear a suit for six days out of a week, maybe even seven sometimes. And it was at that moment that I said, you know what? Sometimes I show up to meetings and the person I'm pitching, which is a Fortune 500 millionaire, is not even wearing a suit. He's just there like, whatever. Like, okay. So I, from that moment on, I said, well, you know what? I wear a suit for 20 years. 10 years in the military, 10 years in prison. I no longer wear a suit. I'm going to go as my authentic self. And, and I'm just going to show up as who I am. But it's imposter syndrome I, every day. Coming in here. Like, you know, sitting in this, like, man, I look up to those people. All of them, like, well, I met her today, but <laughs> I think my guy brought on her because I told her today, you're my competitor. No, <laughs> no but like, I know that people want to like me. I think Green Brian, like, man, like, no one out. I think Needy yeah. Grind, I think him and events, Brian, even, it's like, man, I, I just want to show up like that person, you know, real confident. We could go in here and get the attention of every chick bitch anywhere. Her pitching, she got like down bad. Like I'm an ESL kid. I have a learning disorder. I'm still learning all that. So, but you learn to adapt with it and, and know your value, you know, and know that at the end of the day, you know what? Show up being yourself, be your authentic self. Do not be afraid to ask questions. And the number one rule I think I've learned is people don't know what you don't even know. So yeah. Self doubt is real. Everybody has it. Like when the camera turns off on a, after a meeting, I get immediate self doubt. But like deliver what I just said, like, that's real. Like not gonna take it, and that's what they say: fake it till you be it. Right? Just <laughs> just keep doing what you're doing because as long as you're not a spammer, you're fine. <laughs> I um once you just reminded me, um, Ruben, about what I saw an image once, and it was um a founder as an iceberg. And the top of uh, above the water is what everybody sees. Yeah. And they think, oh, they own a business. They're so happy. They're so lucky. And, you know, <laughs> if you talk to any founder, um, there's just so much going on underneath that you don't show a lot of times, but it's there. And, um, and that, so being your authentic self really is the key, I think. So that you're waking up every day going at it your way um because you don't want to be phony about it that's too much work i mean it's not you have to be authentic or you're going to just burn yourself out that and coffee and coffee, coffee. it's yeah. funny you say that i tell everybody when they ask me how are you doing i'm always like blessed you know yeah and if I'm having, i would say i'm like a duck <laughs> yeah. you ever seen a duck in the water he, they're just cruising them around like like nothing but if you look underneath the water, then people are going like this. Yeah. <laughs> just stay afloat. Yeah. That's like, man, like you'll see me it's probably the most cool, relaxed. But even inside of me, I'm like sweating. I'm like, man, oh Lord. I intentionally stay in the middle for a reason. Rather than on my shirt now. Right? Because <laughs> you hardly ever start in the middle, right? <laughs> you start over there, you start over there. You hardly ever start in the middle. <laughs> Well, and I just want to say too, a founder is different than any other person in a company. You know, it's somebody who's a president or 
an executive or even a silent partner is not the same as the founder. <laughs> it's just they care. You just carry so much more weight, you know, on your shoulders. So. But it helps. I mean, I also run a nonprofit. I didn't know nothing about nonprofits. We scaled it. I lost it last year. We raised 152 grants. This year, we're closing at 466 in grants. My projected for next year is 650. But, you know, but you bring those kind of the skills, what I've learned in the for-profit into the nonprofit, and we seen the success. And I need to be successful in the profit, in the nonprofit because that's my great part line to my profit, right? So I'll just add a note uh, from Britt's comment. We insisted that the Entrepreneurship Center had to have a coffee shop that it could not exist. <laughs> there is a poster right at the front that says, Instant Entrepreneur, just add coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank, uh, the event is not over, but I think the more formal portion is, we have some snacks. Um, our entrepreneurs are going to be around for a little while longer if you want to have individual conversations with them. I want to thank them immensely. Uh, this has been, what a pleasure, the highlight of my week. Um, to, to hear from all of you, such fantastic ideas, such generosity. Let's hear it for all of our entrepreneurs. As well as to our friends at the Bar College of Business for putting us all together. Uh, and yeah, welcome to the Entrepreneurship Center. Uh, our doors are open. Uh, we have brown bag lunches being open to the public every Wednesday at noon. If you want to come and have a meeting here, you want to come and use this space. We're open not just to UWM students and alone, but to the community as well. I do have a question. Yeah. Do we have any entrepreneurs that are doing a startup right now in the audience? Show of hands. Congratulations. Welcome to the family. <laughs> hey, y'all can join us. Come on. We have a I love it. Thank you so much. Sean, oh my God, so great. Yeah, during the pandemic, and I saw your name on the email, and I'm like, oh, I'm monitoring that. I didn't want to come. And uh, yeah, it was great to see you work. I was yeah, awesome. Hopefully, I'll see you around. Oh, come on. Yeah, you. Take care. You too. Did you bring that most pitching context? So, I run a startup challenge. It's not a concept. Oh, okay. The program we help them through their idea. Steve Michael, fortunately, I'm going to be sitting in the back there. I work with them. He runs the La Mafia. It's so often for students to go through our workshops to solidify their idea. They go through his workshops to get the business plan. And then finally, I am. Right. So, okay.